All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube every Monday and every Friday. There's a whole bunch on there that you can go watch right now, so subscribe to the channel. Go back and binge watch. I think we're at 100 interviews right now, so that's a lot to see. If you think you can ask better questions of my guests, maybe you can. Maybe you also just want to see these interviews a week or two before everybody else gets to see them. Go to my Patreon link in the description. Pick the appropriate tier. And the next thing you know, you'll be on here asking questions of great guests like my guest today, Jeff Plate. Jeff Plate has a long career and uh, of a lot of cool bands. You know him from Sabotage. You know him from the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. He also played with the band Four Albums with the band Metal Church. And his new band, Alterain, has a record out right now called Mother's Day. We want you to check that out. We're going to talk about all these things and more right after this. Please welcome Jeff Plate. How you doing, Jason? Thank you for having me, man. Good, Jeff. I'm really glad you're here. And so I was kind of watching up on some Trans-Siberian stuff uh, uh, to, get, uh, to get ready for this. And I've unfortunately I have not seen it here yet because it's not in Las Vegas uh, this tour. Yeah. Um, but we'll so we'll get into that though. Well, that's a tease. Yeah, that's what we in the business call a tease. Uh, so if people want to hear celebrate Christmas early, we're going to get to that. But I want to start going way back because you're from New York originally, yeah. and uh, I want to talk about how you end up becoming a drummer. Oh, basically just because my, my parents always listened to music when I was a kid. You know, I, I grew up in the country. They listened to country music. We watched Hee Haw religiously every Saturday night, mm -hmm. uh, American Bandstand, you know, Soul Train, all that stuff. I was just, my mom was always into playing piano and playing guitar. And she encouraged us kids to pick up an instrument. So, you know, I'm a country boy. I'm athletic. I'm coordinated, I guess you could say. And uh, drums just seem to be the, the the easiest choice because I did try guitar and I tried piano each for probably about two weeks and that was enough. But the drums just was something that I easily gravitated towards. And, you know, I, I, I found I could do it fairly well, even though I was, I was that young. See, I never th would have thought drums is the easiest choice. First of all, you have the worst load in possible, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But you I, after uh, I was too young to think about that then. It was just like mm -hmm. just give me something to hit and uh and and I could do it in time. So it, it all worked out. Yeah, you didn't think about that load into like your tenth club gig where you went, Oh man, and everyone else is just chilling. Yeah. But you but like you say, you also have to have a rhythm, you have to have a coordination, you have to have an idea for it. And obviously, um you were good at it and took to it fast. And so you were moving around at a young age. So tell me a little bit about how the things began. I know Wicked Witch is the band that sort of is the precursor to your involvement with Sabotage. Yeah, you know, when I was, I mean, when I was a kid, there wasn't a whole lot in my area. I'm from rural upstate New York, and that's where I live now. Horseheads, New York is the town I'm in. And, and I mean, when I got into drumming, you know, like I said, I, I kind of, I picked it up pretty well. I, I could play along to songs. I, I had rhythm. Uh, Chicago, Chicago 7 was was the first album I ever bought when I was 12 years old. And I I just love that band for, you know, being that young and listening to that record now. It's, it's kind of, it's a very eclectic record. It's interesting that I was I was tuned into that. But, but a year later, I saw Kiss on the Midnight Special, and that just completely blew my mind. I was 13 years old, and I looked at that show, and I said, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the beginning of my, of my mission. And, you know, it didn't take me long to figure out if I was going to achieve some sort of success like that. I was going to have to leave the town I was in. So, you know, once I got through high school, I moved to Florida. Which, uh, which oddly enough, I moved down there when I was like 19 years old. And I was always one or two people. I lived in the Tampa area. So I was always one or two people away from running into Johnny or running into the Olivas. It was just kind of funny after the fact when I, when I ended up joining the band years later. But uh, Florida didn't work out. I came back home to New York. And then I had some friends in uh, the Boston area and moved out there. And 
And that is really where I, I realized how much work I needed to put into what I was doing because I was playing a lot as it was, you know, as a teenager, I was, I was playing in clubs. I was practicing all the time. I was, you know, just doing my thing. And, and honestly, back when I was that age, the distraction of computers and cell phones and 24 hour, this and that wasn't part of our life back then. So music was really my thing playing drums. I played drums practice for two or three hours a day, every day. And, but once I got out into the Boston area, I realized I had to, <laughs> I had some work to do because there were some players out there that just completely blew me away. And it was a great introduction to, to the competition that I was up against and what I really needed to do to, to achieve what I wanted to. So, so it was, it was great, but I moved out there in 1984. I spent 10 years in the Boston area. I would think there was a lot of guys from Berkeley and stuff too. You know, you're talking about all these great drummers out there. There's probably lots of guys going to Berkeley and, you know, all kind of competing in a sense. Yes, there was uh, I really didn't run into too much of that. Um, although I knew of Berkeley and, and all of the, you know, Mike Mangini was always the talk of the town when I was out there. Mm. And, but I ran into a guy named Dave DeCenzo. Um, his dad owned a drum shop on the South shore of Boston in Quincy, Quincy, Mass. Uh, Dave was a, a drummer. Uh, he was working with some friends of mine. He was also a teacher and I began taking lessons from Dave. And, and granted, he was he was a couple of years younger than I was at the time. But he could smoke me with one arm tied behind his back and one foot. You know, I was like, man. So I hooked up with Dave. I learned a lot from Dave. He really, really helped me focus on technique and form, uh, the importance of reading and dynamics and, you know, all this and that. Just some little things that, you know, somebody needs to nudge you one way or the other. And this really helped improve my drumming. And between Dave DeCenzo, uh, the other players that were in the area, that, that there were a lot of them, but, but one of the main turning events in my life was I saw a clinic by Simon Phillips. Uh, Simon Phillips is, is world renowned drummer. He played with The Who, he's played with Toto, he's done a lot of solo stuff. But I just saw a drum clinic by him and he just completely blew me away. And I thought, you know, if I'm ever going to get to that level, I've got to figure it out. So this is this is when I got Dave DeCenzo as a teacher and really, really began focusing a little bit more and getting very serious about about my craft and what I was doing. So so that was uh, that was awesome. I mean, I. Uh, the other thing, too, is like coming from the town that I was from, we had a great live scene here. But you go into the Boston area and every night of the week, there is just music everywhere. There's bands to go see. And yeah, it was a really, really great experience for me at that time of my life to be to be in that area. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the bands you start playing with. Because like I was saying, Wicked Witch, singer for Wicked Witch is Zach Stevens, who will yep. eventually become the lead singer of Sabotage and eventually bring you into that um, project. So tell me how that comes about. So I ran into, well, a friend of mine told me that I needed to hook up with this guitarist named Matt Leff. Matt Leff was a GIT graduate, and he was he was just this great hard rock metal guitarist. And, you know, he was in his, his 20s like I was. He had just come back from GIT, and he had just returned from an audition with Ronnie James Dio. And as I understand it, he, he he was like, he did not get the gig, but he was the next guy in line. So so Matt had this, uh, you know, he had this little bit of a reputation. And we hooked up and started working together. We hit it off really, really well. Um, musically, we, we just clicked. We became good friends. Matt left when he was at GIT out in Hollywood, ran into Zach Stevens who was going to VIT, Vocal Institute of Technology. And so those two had hooked up out in Hollywood in the in the early 80s and actually did a couple demos together. When Matt and I really started developing a thing, which, which was Wicked Wish, uh, Matt said, you know, Zach's the guy we got to get to sing in this band. And so we flew Zach from, from Hollywood to Boston. I believe this was in 1980. 
87, I believe it was. 88, maybe. God. Anyhow, it was just interesting. I, we, we flew Zach into Boston and we, we pick him up at Logan Airport. And we said, uh, okay, let's let's take this guy out and have a couple of drinks. You know, I, I needed to get to to get to know him and talk with him. We went to a club called The Channel and a big rock club in Boston. And oddly enough, this band Sabotage was playing at The Channel. Hmm. And so we went in. Zach had just recently met Sabotage when they played in Hollywood. So Zach was working at a hotel. The guys came through the hotel. He, he met them and just talk about connections and synchronicity and all that. It was just kind of weird how all that happened. But, but yeah, so this was the beginning of, of Wicked Witch, you know, and we had a bass player, Mark Stewart. Did a bunch of songs. We, we played around the Boston area for a good couple, two or three years. Did really, really well in the live thing. We demoed up a bunch of, of really good songs. And we we were hoping to get a, a deal in America. Had we been a little bit more savvy and maybe somebody pointed us in the right direction, we probably could have got a deal through Europe or Japan or something like that. But nothing came to us through the States. And oddly enough, right about the time Nirvana came along, <laughs> which completely changed the music scene. Uh, Zach had, had received a request from, from the band Sabotage to become their lead singer, or at least to go try out. And, and that's what he did. And then Zach got the job in Sabotage and uh, Matt and I were, we were left without a singer and not only left without a singer, but left in Boston with a completely different music scene than what we had been, you know, working in the previous year or two. So, so things took a, took quite a change at that point for us. Yeah. I can only imagine. So what do you do in the, in the meantime? Cause Zach does get the gig with Sabotage and uh, I'm thinking that's around 93. Yep. And, uh, and, and so, and Sabotage is going through a hard time because Chris Oliva is going to uh, tragically die in, in a car, in a car accident that I, and I, just had Johnny Lee Middleton on the show. And so for those who aren't that familiar, you can go back and watch that. And Johnny talks in, in great detail about how hard that was on everybody at the time. Um, and John Oliva finishes that record sort of as a tribute to his, his brother. And he pretty much plays everything on the record, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's going to uh, step aside. Zach Stevens, as we said, is going to uh, come in. They, they both coexist at different times of the band also, but at this point, I believe it's going to be Zach. And they're making some changes, and they need a drummer. How does they? How does Zach approach you? Well, to backing up a little bit, when, when Zach joined Sabotage, I, I was just thrilled for him. It's like, you know, one of us has to do this, and I'm glad that, you know, at least one of us got this shot. So so Zach went off in in they did Edge of Thorns, 1993, when they released Edge of Thorns. Uh, I remember sitting with Matt Leff and we listened to that record. Granted, I had known who Sabotage was through Headbangers Ball. I think I'd seen the Mountain King video and Gutter Ballet video maybe. Yeah. Um, but Matt and I one night listened through Edge of Thorns and I remember Matt going, holy, this guitar player is phenomenal. Chris Oliva. And we listened through that record and Zach sounded great. You know, we're, we were both, of course, when you lose somebody like that, you're upset, but you're also excited for them and you're kind of proud of the fact. And, but that record really, Matt and I listened to it and we were, we were just blown away about how good it was like, man. So fast forward, you know, I made a decision. I had been in Boston for 10 years. So I moved back home to Horseheads, New York. Zach, went on tour with Sabotage, supporting Edge of Thorns. I came back home kind of thinking, uh, all right, I need to regroup. I need to be around my family for a while, and then I'm going to figure it out. So in the meantime, I began working here locally and just kind of developing my thing back here locally, doing some teaching, playing out a lot. Zach uh, had a successful first run with Sabotage and Edge of Thorns. That album came out, did very well for them. And then unfortunately later that year in 93, Chris Oliva died in the car accident. So about the beginning of 94, 
I was talking with Matt Leff and he said, have you spoken to Zach? And would you mind giving him a ring and seeing what he's, what he's going to do? Because at that point we understood sabotage was really obviously in turmoil. You know, everything was up in the air for the band. So I, I reached out to Zach and, you know, just asked how he was and what was going on. And, and he said, uh, he said, well, Jeff, they're going to continue with the band. John Oliva and Paul O'Neill want to continue sabotage and they want you to be the drummer. <laughs> and I'm in Horseheads, New York, which is the last place I ever expected to get this news or this request. And I was just completely floored. Zach, when and where? So they were in the process of writing Handful of Rain. Like you just mentioned, John did all the instrumentation. Zach did all the vocals. Uh, they brought Alex Skolnick, in, Skolnick to do lead guitars on the record. And I went down to Florida and met the guys. We just hit it off and, you know, talked with Paul about what was going on, talked with John. Obviously, Zach and I reconnected after, you know, we hadn't seen each other for a couple of years. And they sent me back home and basically said, all right, go back home and learn everything. <laughs> and we'll see you in the fall when we, when we get ready for a tour. And I couldn't believe it. I was just completely blown away by, by the fact that I'd finally was going to get the gig, you know? And it was also exciting, too, to be, be reconnected with Zach Stevens, who, who Zach is awesome. Zach is awesome. He's just one of the best singers out there. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a really cool moment in my life, to say the least. Yeah. And so you go on a U.S. tour in 1994. Uh, the following year, Going to release this live album we're looking at right here, live in Japan. Uh, and this is from, I believe, the tour is from '94, but the record comes out in '95. And this is this is a far, uh, you know, a long way from where you were. You know, all of a sudden playing these places, putting out a live album, and part of an established band. Yeah, and and even getting to this point here for this live record was was interesting because as I was asked to be in Sabotage, obviously the band had changed so much. Zach was the new lead singer. There was going to be a new drummer. Chris Oliva was gone. It was it was just amazing that they even decided to keep the band going. Yeah. So before I even got to tour, there was some, some question about, you know, was Steve Wachholz going to come back into the band? Mm -hmm. And completely understandable you know the record labels like you know this band is not the same band that we we knew you know familiar faces and players and everything has changed so so there was some question as to whether steve was actually going to come back in and join the band for the tour um so i just stuck to my guns i stuck to my program at home and, and kept working on everything and then i think it was september i got the call and they said jeff you know get yourself down here you're gonna you're gonna go on tour and that was so exciting just to have that confirmed. When I got down there and began rehearsing with the band, the whole thing really clicked. I, I really clicked well with Johnny Middleton and John Oliva. Um, and of course, I was very, very aware of what the band had just gone through. So my thought was, keep your mouth shut, do your job. And, you know, don't give these guys any reason to doubt you or to, you know, regret having you come down and do this. But the first few shows we did on that handful of rain tour were very tough. I mean, doing the shows for the first time without Chris Oliva. Um, I had never met Chris and I, I wish I could have met him somewhere along the line. But but to do these shows without him, you know, obviously John was back on stage with the band. Um Johnny was like Chris Oliva's best friend and brother. It was tough. It was tough. I was surprised we even got out of Florida. I mean, we started the tour in Florida. I think we did three shows. Every one of them had some, some bit of chaos and drama attached to it. And I remember, I remember coming out of Florida. We were heading for Atlanta. We just played Tampa, which was extremely difficult for everybody. And here again, I'm still on the outside kind of looking in and thinking, Oh my God. And we left Florida. Johnny was, he was upset and we were, we were in the back lounge and 
drinking a beer and Johnny was just talking to me about, you know, how this didn't feel right and how this and that and every other thing. And as he's telling me this, the transmission goes in the bus. So all of a sudden this bus makes this hell of a noise and he sat there and he looked at me and he goes, well, Jeff, I guess we need a new bus. And we got off, we got off the bus and got a new bus and continued on the tour and it just rolled from there. But I mean, even at that point, I was thinking to myself, am I even going to last in this? <laughs> you know, I'm actually on the tour bus. I have no idea how much longer this is even going to work, but, uh, but yeah, here we are all these years later and, and we're all still working together. And it was just a, just a hell of a hell of a beginning to something really incredible. Yeah, and for sure, because you're stepping into it, like you said, it's the handful of rain tour. You're promoting a record that you know that you didn't play on. Johnny didn't play on it, and no. you got, and now you're in a band that is definitely in flux and dealing with tragedy. And you know, who knows? The live record comes out, uh, but you're, you know, you don't know the direction of it, uh, where it's going to go. And fortunately, no. um, for everyone involved. Uh, a career is going to come from this record, Dead Winter Dead. Um, I don't think anybody in the world could have predicted this. Uh, for people who might not know, and I'm be surprised you're watching a video with the guy from Sabotage or not, but Paul O'Neill was sort of the genius, uh, uh, one of the geniuses, obviously, behind Sabotage, and he was almost the other member. He, he was the producer, and he had these ideas, and a lot of them, and one of the ideas was for the song, uh, Christmas Eve, Sarajevo, 1224, which is on this record. When that song is recorded, it's cool, but could you have any idea what was about to happen with it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, it was, I mean, here again, this was my first venture, even though I just did the live record with the band. This was my first venture into the studio with Sabotage. I am still the new guy. Um, so these decisions were, you know, they weren't mine to be, to be made or even was my opinion necessary. It was just like, yeah, what are we doing? Okay, great. Paul, you mentioned Paul being, being a member of Sabotage. He absolutely was. I mean, him and John and Chris Oliva were, were the team that built from, from Hall of the Mountain King on they built that band and, and that legacy. Those albums are just brilliant. And you could actually hear the seeds of TSO. If you listen back to Gutter Ballet and Streets and you know albums like that, you kind of hear what Paul was thinking. Paul and John had some other stuff going on outside of Sabotage. But this story that Paul wrote around Dead, Winter, Dead was about the war going on in Sarajevo at the time. And he was... Paul was very, very smart. He was well read on everything going on in Europe. Uh, he was fascinated with war and human tragedy. You know, he was a very compassionate person and this war bothered him so much. And the story of the cellist playing in the middle of Sarajevo, you know, while, while bombs are going off, hell is breaking loose around this guy and he's sitting there trying to probably trying to trying to keep himself sane but trying to bring some sanity to this situation and you know Paul connected all this to this song and Carol of the Bells God rest you merry gentlemen Paul O'Neill John Oliva and Bob Kinkle came up with a, an arrangement for this song the idea of it injecting a Christmas song into this record seemed so strange at first mm -hmm. and you know, I remember the guys going back and forth with each other in the studio about this. And but when you heard the final version of the song, it's like, holy cow, that that sounds great. And it musically, sonically, it fit in with the record. So you couldn't argue that fact. But I know Paul and John went round and around about this many, many times. And I'm sure John John has all the details. But uh, at the end of the day, the song made it on the record. And and that record, when it was released, Christmas Eve, Sarajevo 1224 took off in a completely different direction than the band. And all of a sudden it just opened this door for what was to come. And <laughs> nobody nobody could have seen it coming. I remember thinking, uh, especially as TOSO would grow, these guys have duped people into watching a heavy metal band. I was like, <laughs> how great is this? I would tell people, 
that's a heavy metal band called Sabotage, you know. But how cool that it it it, it was growing so big. And so at the time that song comes out, it starts to get radio play and people start to get interest. And maybe at first people think this is the heavy metal, you know, Mannheim steamroller. But as it plays, you're starting to go on talk shows and radio shows. And all of a sudden, this song has a bigger life than probably Sabotage had at the time. In, in, the, in America, especially. Absolutely. I mean, this, this thing hit on, it started with Mason Dixon down in Tampa. He started running this song. Um, the sister station in New York, I, I can't think of the call letters right now, but, but they started running a song. The reaction to the song was great. And I mean, when that song came out, I mean, you know, think of it, everybody did Chris songs, but they were really quite watered down and very nice and very, you know, there wasn't really an edge to any of these songs. And all of a sudden you hear this, bam, da 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 dun da 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 dun It's like, wow, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. So this really, this song just connected with, with a lot of hard rockers, a lot of heavy metalers, and a lot of people who just heard the song for what it was. It was a great song. It was a great arrangement. But, but to your point, in the States, this thing took off on radio like a rocket. And it was unbelievable what was coming at us at that time in the States. Rosie O'Donnell, you know, I'm talking about TV shows. I think we played on CNN. A lot of this stuff was really, like I said, this was coming from all different directions than what Sabotage had been used to. And the audience that this song connected with it was a lot different than what sabotage was used to also yeah. but along with that dead winter dead when that album was released in europe the album itself took off in europe so here we have this song in america that was going really well and all of a sudden this new album in europe was going really well so paul had a couple of pretty cool things going on there at one time yeah um, for sure so it's strange because okay so the record Sabotage comes out in 95. Obviously, uh, Paul and everyone else must be thinking, we have got to get a Trans-Siberian Orchestra record out. So this is 96. You have played on every one of these TSO records right from the beginning. Yep. And uh, this is Christmas Eve and other stories. This is where it begins. And, um, and you can tell us it starts small. <laughs> yeah, it starts small. I mean, Paul... Paul was a writer. He had so many different stories and ideas, and this was kind of an extension of all that. But Christmas Eve, Sarajevo was the vehicle that Paul needed to really further his musical and his lyrical aspirations. You know, Paul was a storyteller. He had a lot of stuff going on. And this album, I mean, obviously, Christmas Eve, Sarajevo is a Christmas song. So Paul had had some Christmas stories and ideas going on. This is the perfect time to put all this together and, and make it work. So between Paul and John Oliva and Bob Kinkle, they they put this album together. And when it came out the following year, which was 96, like you mentioned, the album became a hit. So all of a sudden, you know, Trans-Siberian Orchestra was born. Uh, Another thing that Paul had been thinking about for years was actually the name of the band. You know, that was that was something he had tucked away in his mind for a long time. And Trans-Siberian Orchestra was born. It had a name. It had a direction. Uh, the, the, the Christmas connection to all of it really helped expand the audience, obviously. And when you when you listen to this record, not only are there great songs, but in my opinion, the star of this record is the story. And, and the story is what carried the TSO live show for the first 10, 12 years that we that we toured. Paul O'Neill struck gold with this story because it really talked, it spoke to everybody. Um, you know, it was about adversity, it was about tragedy, and it was just about the human emotion. And it just really connected. It really connected. But but like I said, as as Christmas Eve and other stories was released in America, we had this thing brewing over in Europe with sabotage. So so for for several years there, we really had the best of both worlds. It was it was it was a great run. Yeah. Oh, oh for sure. Did Paul um, actually go and experience the Trans Siberian? Uh, he did do the ride, right? That's 
how the story goes. He rode the railway yeah. all the way from uh, God. I'm not even sure where it where it starts, but you know, all the way through Siberia and into Russia. And and as he always explained it, he was just fascinated by this this railway that connected all these different people, all these different climates, uh, all the different environments, all the different types of people. He connected that to music, really, and that is how that name came about. It, it stuck with Paul in his mind and, and he made that connection between between that that train ride and, and his his thought about music and just connecting with people. So it was at first it was like Trans Siberian what? You know, and and then after a while it's like, oh it makes perfect sense. So yeah. So based on what you're saying, I get the feeling that because sabotage does so well in Europe, that might bring life to another sabotage record. Absolutely. We uh the Dead Winter Dead Tour that we did in Europe in 1996. Um, so here again, we are really introducing a new version of Sabotage at this point. You know, myself, Zach Stevens, John Oliva, and Johnny are intact. Uh, Skolnick was no longer with us. So Chris Caffrey came back into the band. And Al Petrelli, guitarist, came into the band. And... We went over to Europe, not, we knew the tour would be good, but we had no idea what was coming. We, we went over there and we basically sold out every venue we played, people waiting outside, people just ecstatic over the band. And they loved the record, but Sabotage had set up, had already had a legacy, you know, those previous records had just made such a mark around the world and especially Europe. I mean, Germany especially just loves the band Sabotage. So I remember the first show we played in, in Europe. It was in Germany. It was in Bochum. And I can't remember. I think it was Jesus Saves, which may have been the second or third song in the set. The audience was louder than the band. And I remember Petrelli turning around and looking at me on stage and going, can you believe this? It was unreal. It was just so awesome. It was so exciting. And so we had a great run on that tour in early 96. We did a summer metal meetings tour, festival tour, which we headlined in th that same year. But uh, but that set us up for the Wake of Magellan, like you he, like he just mentioned. And uh, this record came out in Europe. I think we charted at number nine in Germany. Uh, it, was, it was really, really really good good record another really cool story by paul um this lineup was now intact this was the band and we again went over to europe i got, i think it was 98 that we went over there supporting this record did, did extremely well again um and along with that you know tso is getting bigger in the states and paul and john and company are, are writing another tso record so yeah i think some good things were going on at the time yeah, so it's almost like one year uh, Sabotage, one year TSO as far as records go. Wake of Magellan, 97. Uh, and then we get The Christmas Attic, 98. And so yeah. it's that juggling game. And one of the things that's so fascinating about this uh, whole Sabotage experience is, the, uh, a Trans-Siberian experience, I should say, is that uh, it starts with a few shows. Maybe we'll go put this thing out for eight shows, right? Uh, Bill Lewis, WNCX in Cleveland. Uh, he's the man that really pushed Paul to take TSO on the road. Uh, he had been playing Christmas Eve and other stories in its entirety every Christmas Eve since it was released. And, and the reaction to the album, to all of it, was just fantastic. And, and obviously we had this we had a hit single around this around the states with Chris or with Christmas Eve Sarajevo. Um, Christmas Attic was also a success. We had some good uh, airplay with Bowser Holly, and so Bill really really pushed Paul into you know let's you guys should really try to take this out and see how it works. So so we did that in 1999. They booked a seven show tour, and theaters in the Northeast and here again, not knowing exactly what, <laughs> how, how was this going to work out? We, we knew we had something musically that was a, a success 
but how was this thing going to translate live? And we went and did the first show in Philadelphia, the Tower Theater. Uh, I remember we were all so nervous and the audience was a mixed bag of, of everything and everybody, <laughs> families with young children, older people. You had, you had people with the Testament shirts on and sabotage shirts. It was like, Oh my God. And there was a couple sitting in the front row who I know they must've been there to see an orchestra because she was dressed silk dress, red silk dress. He was like in a tux and the dry ice is coming off the stage right into their lap. And I thought, Oh my God, we're doomed. And we played this show standing ovation. The couple loved it. And I was just blown away by what happened. But that, Every time we played and every time, I mean, every year we went out, the thing got bigger, but that, that seven show tour turned into 70 shows the following year. And we were just trying to figure out how are we going to navigate doing all these shows at the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve. So this, this became the, uh, the, the birth of the second TSO band and, and we've had an East coast and West coast group ever since. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's how you juggle Two two shows a day um, in different cities, and and you get quality bands. I want to talk a little bit about that because uh, you know my friend Blas Elias here from Vegas. He's in yeah. the West Coast version right now. You're yeah. in the East Coast version. Is the East Coast version still basically the sabotage guys? No. When this when this split happened, uh, basically myself and Chris Caffrey stayed on the East. Johnny Middleton and Al Petrelli went west. We needed to have a music musical director for the West Coast, which was Al. Uh, Bob Kinkle was one of the main songwriters and the musical director on the East, so we we had that covered. But yeah, it, it just really kind of it, it worked out well that way. And then we had to fill in the cast around that. So it was an interesting. I mean, just seeing how this whole thing developed over the first few years, I was just, I was just blown away about how well received this thing was. But, but we had a very, very good band. We we had great music, and like I said, the story, the story to me was the star of the show, and that's and that's how people really connected to us. The thing snowballed. I mean, literally every year, these crowds just grew in size, and the venues got bigger. And yeah, next thing you know, we're doing arenas twice a day major arenas. I, I remember the first time we played in, uh, God, I think it was the arena in Hershey, which was like the biggest room that we had played in. I remember walking on the stage and going, I can't believe what's going on. <laughs> and it was sold out, you know, unreal, but doing, doing two shows a day in these major arenas around the country. Uh, it's just something that uh, nobody would have ever expected. Yeah. And your description is perfect because it's become an event for everybody. Christmas is, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously people get festive, but so you have the families, you have the people who've grown with it. There's people who this is a big thing. They go every season, multiple shows. And then uh, uh, it only makes me wonder, are there Christmas groupies out there? Maybe you better not answer. You better not answer. Uh, I guess you could call them that. But, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's something to think that this band that you are a part of has become a tradition. And there's people that just don't function well in the holidays until they see our show. There's some people that our show is their family get together. Yes. You know, they bring everybody to the show. They have a good time. The show is amazing. It's, it's amazing. And I just don't say that because I'm in the band. I've sat in the drum seat from the very beginning. I've seen it grow above me, behind me, the audience, you know, everything about it. The show every year is just a great show. And if you've never seen it, any of you people out there listening to this, please check it out. It, there, there, is, there is no show like it anywhere. And there is something in this show for everybody. If you, even if you've never heard a TSO song before, you will recognize some of our music, mm -hmm. not just because of TSO being played on, t on television or the radio, but there are so many classical music themes, classical holiday themes that, that they've, that Paul and, and company have woven into these songs. It really is something that just connects with, with everybody. And, you know, I, uh, I pinch myself every, every time I get on stage, you know, I still remember being a kid watching kiss on TV when I was 13 and dreaming of something like this. And, 
And and now every year we're we're able to bring this thing out and do this. But uh, but the people that come to see us, call them what you will, groupies or or whatever, they are loyal beyond loyal. We we could not be doing this without them. And there's a number of people who come to see us multiple times a year. You know, they'll they'll get a seat down front, they'll get a seat in the back. There's so much production, it's a different show no matter where you sit. So it's it's really cool in that respect. Yeah, that's what um, I've always been told about the show. No matter where you sit, you will get a different per perception of it and how great it is. So I, I, I hate to talk about current world events because to me, people watch these shows. They want to hear about music. They don't want to hear the news. They can, the, the world has enough of that. But as of right now, and it is September 2021, Trans-Siberian Orchestra is gearing up east and west to go on the road. And I think it's a great thing if it's safe. And and I know that for you guys, your jobs are on the line, you know, your money. This is a big this is a big part of your years for a long time. The question is, do you you know you assume that you're gonna play? Is that there's always the risk that this doesn't happen. So tell me a little bit about the thought process that's going on right now. Okay, so so Show dates were released today. Um, you know, obviously, preparing for a tour like these TSO tours takes months. So, so the management has been preparing for this, you know, since earlier in the year, fully aware that COVID is still out there and there still is a problem. Um, we got some very smart people working in our camp, obviously, and they, they keep an eye on everything. We've got a number of friends who are out touring with some some big acts. Uh, one of my old drum techs is out working with Guns N' Roses right now. I, I spoke to him the other night. Uh, we've got people out working with the with the big Green Day tour. It's like, how are you guys doing this? And everybody is masking up. Band and crew are in a bubble. Uh, granted, you can run into this thing. There's a risk no matter what you do. There's a risk. So. You know, for us to to not try to do this, I think would be a mistake. Uh, obviously, last year we couldn't, so we so we did the live stream last year. When we did the live stream last year, I mean that was quite a quite an experience itself. I mean, getting to the getting to the venue, quarantining for three days in a hotel, being tested every day going through this protocol, I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe that we got through that without any problems. But so we will do our best to keep ourselves clean, keep ourselves healthy. And as far as our interaction with the audience, which has always been a big part of what we do, uh, we'll have to wait and see, you know, how that plays out. Sure. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some rules that, that surround all that, but but here again, it would be it, it would be a mistake for us to not attempt to do this. We we have the luxury of a couple more months. Our tour does not start until the middle of November, mm -hmm. so hopefully things will subside. Maybe they'll get become a little more sane, and and we can figure out how to get through this without any issues. But you know, for me and. I mentioned Chris Caffrey and Petrelli and Johnny. We, we've been doing this since 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, last year was the first year that I was literally home for Christmas in all that time. So that was nice, but <laughs> I should be doing my job. Uh, this is my career. This is what I love to do. And and we've created something for the ages. It just, to, to me, it's, it's something that I need to do. I know I speak for a lot of my bandmates too, but but we have become very accustomed to being away from from home on the holidays. But but the show that we're bringing to the people is just it's just amazing. It's something it's something we're all very very proud of. And, and like I said, we are going to do our best to make sure we get through this thing without any problems. And, and let's hope let's hope everything else on the outside of us works in our favor too. Yes, and it is very important to people. So if it can be done, like you said, you have to plan in advance. If we get to November and hopefully things are in a better place and there's a safe way to do it. What a treat it will be for people to spend the holidays with, with TSO again and have some of the familiarities. I think that's why we love the holidays. We like we look forward to hearing the, our favorite music and shows and things. And this, you know, like you said, since 1999, this has come uh, become part of people's lives. So let's hope 
that everyone can uh, stay healthy and that they, like you said, there are bands who are working to figure out how to keep it in a bubble and make it safe. This has never happened before. No. And um, it's unpredictable for everybody. Uh, so I want to go back on Sabotage just a little bit. When you make this record, uh, Poets and Mad Men, do you have any idea that uh, this could be the last record? Um, well, I, I, you know, that's a good question. I think at the time we, we were trying not to think that way. <laughs> uh, although the trans Green Orchestra at that time was obviously becoming the priority because it was becoming big. Uh, sabotage in John Oliva, give John Oliva for sticking with Sabotage through everything that they had gone through. You know, losing his brother probably should have ended the band. Um, and it didn't. We kept this thing going. And, and luckily, kept keeping it going spawned the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So, you know, Paul or John had been been working in Sabotage, obviously, for all these years. You could say he was successful. You could also say it was a struggle. You know, Sabotage, as much as these records are great records and the band is great, you know, it did not, in my opinion, it did not enjoy the success that it deserved. And when you are a part of something like that, it can become very, very frustrating. So trans Orchestra was a way for Paul and John and everybody involved in the writing and everything to finally capitalize on what they've been working for for all those years. When we came in to do Poets and Mad Men, uh, Zach Stevens had left. Zach Stevens was no longer our singer. Right. And this was, you know, I was upset about this. Um, there were reasons, and, and that's completely, you know, their thing. But when we went into the studio to do this record, I mean, here again, now it's down to four. Myself, Johnny, Caffrey, and John. And the four of us had literally been working together. We stuck together since 1994. Um, we went in there with a really good head about the whole thing. And TSO, like I said, was successful. We were we were working on the Beethoven's Last Night CD. So we went in to, the, to do this record. And the music's great. I was completely, like, jazzed about doing this record this stuff rocks it's awesome so we got in there and and we we put this record together and put it out honestly i think it's it to me it's my proudest recording moment with the band i i love the songs on the record uh i was really happy with the drum production and and everything that was going on around it but you know obviously al petrelli at the time was playing in megadeth so here we are again, replacing band members. And while this is all going on, TSO is, is still getting bigger. We had no idea really what was coming down, down the pike for us. It was, you know, we, we brought in Damon Janaya as lead singer. Uh, we, we did a couple tours with Damon on lead vocals, who Damon was a fantastic singer. And we had Jack Frost on guitar for a tour with Jeff Waters from Annihilator filled in for a tour. And, these were good tours. I mean, and the band was very good, but here again, with, with the work involved with TSO and building, building this thing, you know, and rightly so the, the focus really was on that. And, and I think after the fact, John had kind of just decided along with Paul that, you know, let's, let's just sink everything into TSO right now and really try to strike, you know, we've got lightning in a bottle here. Let's, let's, let's ride this thing out and see where we can go with it. So, so unfortunately, 2002 was the last time we actually did a proper tour with Sabotage, and uh, and yeah, you know, for me it was it was a bummer. For all of us, it was a bummer. But but we had something else. We were all still working together as a unit, and uh, and things were really going well. Yeah, and jumping ahead, and we're going to go back too. But jumping ahead, uh, 2015. This is one of the most incredible things you can see. I recommend everyone go to YouTube and, and look this up. So. This giant festival, two massive stages. You've got Sabotage on one stage. You've got Trans-Siberian on the other stage. And at one point in the night, it's all happening at the same time. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, just tell me what that experience was like. You've never seen anything like it, and you probably never will see anything like it again. It was just 
so so Paul Paul had dozens of grandiose ideas, mm. and sometimes you would like to scratch your head and go, "We're never going to pull that off." But he always talked about he wanted to have TSO West and TSO East performing together on the same stage. How is that physically going to be possible? You know, we just thought it was just one of these things. He liked to throw this idea around. And so Vakin and Paul and company agreed to do this. And of course, along with this was, was a sabotage reunion. And, but the idea was at the end of the show, like you mentioned, that both groups were actually going to be playing on main stages at the same time. So to make this whole thing work, uh, it was one thing for us as musicians and singers to get on stage and do this, but the technical aspect of this, the monitoring system that had to be created in order for all of us to hear each other, mm -hmm. you know, that, that second stage is a good 100 feet away, if not more. Probably more. Add, add to that torrential rains. It was just... <laughs> It was unbelievable. But anyhow, we, we got to rehearsals. They worked out all the bugs. In theory, this should work. So we got over there. And of course, when we got to when we got to, to Vakin, it was raining torrentially for several days. There was at least a foot of mud on, on the festival grounds. And we did not even get to do a proper run through and sound check the night before. So the next day, it's like show's on. We get up there and we do this. It was unbelievable. 80,000 people. And of course, everybody was just very excited to see Sabotage, which we were all really excited about playing. But then once, once the Trans-Siberian Orchestra kicked in on the second stage, they started going back and forth. And then the whole thing happened while we were all playing together. And somehow or another, we pulled it off. We pulled it off. The 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 rain stopped. The sky, the sky opened up. The moon came, appeared above the stage. The fireworks going. On. It was just you couldn't have scripted it any better. But I was so thrilled for Paul because he had just dreamed of doing this and he just pulled it off. I cannot imagine the knot in his stomach the whole time it was going on because we were literally one audio connection or one power source. That was that could have gone bad, that could have derailed the show, and it all hung together. It all worked, and man, we got through it. There was I was I was so relieved. I think everybody was, but Paul, I was so happy <laughs> that we were able to do this and pull this off. And uh, yeah, no, never been done before, and probably will never be done again. So it was yeah. it was a very proud moment for all of us. Yeah, and a great, like you say, a great accomplishment for Paul, who will pass away a few years later, tragically. Um, so something that uh, he, he fulfilled so much in his lifetime, you know, just by talking about these things and his ideas. I think all sort of geniuses are crazy idea men underneath it all. I'll do this and I have that and I'm going to put this. Yeah. And most people will tell you, you're crazy. It can't be done. And Paul really persevered and he did get to see the success of these things and, and his legacy with Sabotage and with trans Siberian Orchestra will always live on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you talk about people with, with crazy ideas. Do you have the guts to try to pull it off? I mean, I'll, I'll give him all the credit in the world. I mean, just, just the idea, you know, here again, looking back, it's like keeping Sabotage together was, you know, from some people, this was crazy. Paul, why are you doing this? And then putting a Christmas song on a sabotage record. You know, this is crazy, Paul. Why are you doing this? You know, trans Siberian Orchestra, this is nuts. Doing live, this is, you know, everything. He heard it from all angles. And Paul was just, Paul believed in what he was doing. And you have to give that man a lot of credit for being able to, to not only create the trans Siberian Orchestra and, and build this legacy of music with sabotage, you know, leading into TSO, but to just stick by your guns. I mean, the first several years of touring with TSO, he didn't make any money. I mean, yeah. he, he was probably losing money hand over fist. It took, it took a while for it to catch. And when it caught, it just kind of exploded. And, you know, I mentioned playing, playing two, arena, two arenas, two shows in an arena a day. You know, all of a sudden, this just became the norm. 
it was it was just unbelievable. But you know, all that hard work and that persistence, and and here again, he had the product and he knew it, so he kept pushing until it broke. Yeah, absolutely. A testament to his hard work yep. and, and dedication. Um, so 2015, that's the last time Sabotage plays together. I know Sabotage fans want to know what's in the future. Well, you mentioned losing Paul, and that completely messed things up. You know, Paul was Paul was the the director of everything that was Sabotage and TSL. I mean, Paul and John are partners, but Paul really was the guy that, that you know, made things happen. So, so we lost Paul and, and, you know, it took us, it took Paul and his family in management a couple of years just to get back on their feet. The TSO live show, um, that is such an established machine. You know, we, we can make this happen every year. Going ahead creatively and producing new music, this is this is where, you know, it's been a bit of a, it's stalled because of losing Paul. Um, so John is always writing music, and I know there's been a dozen reports or comments or quotes or whatever you want to call it. John is always writing music, and whether it's for John Oliva, whether it's for Sabotage, whether it's for TSO, he's always writing. So. What is he doing? I mean, I know I know he's doing that. Um, and also, too, there's a bunch of unfinished trans Siberian orchestra music that we would like to be able to present to the world. You know, Paul was very close to having some things done. So honestly, I think that is probably the, the, the focus is trying to get the, the TSO music finished up. Some of the stuff that Paul really wanted to bring out to, to the world. We would love to get some of this done. But Sabotage, you know, I tell you something. Years and years ago, I I just not just coming to the conclusion, but the reality is I work for John and I work for Paul. You know, Sabotage is not really my band. TSO is really not my band either. These decisions are made, you know, they, they may talk to me about stuff, but I don't make the decisions on this and I am good with that. This is their thing. I am a part of it. I am, you know, more than thrilled to be to be the drummer in in these bands. So what goes? What happens in the future? You know, I don't know. I'm ready for whatever it is. But I will say this: that, like I said, we haven't done a proper tour with Sabotage since 2002, and there is still this clamoring for this band mm -hmm. every year. In you know, I I just think, you know what, we did our job. When, when Sabotage was out there on that stage, we, we brought it every night, we performed well every night, and we left a mark, so to speak. And I'm very, very proud of that. If, if we had a limped off into, you know, the sunset, people may have just kind of forgotten about us or written us off by now. But that is not what happened. And, and I also think the fact that we are all still alive, yeah. you know, unfortunately without Paul, but we are all still together. We all still work together in TSO. We all still see each other every year. So, so people look at that and think, oh, well, they must be this or they must be that. We'll see what happens. I, I, I trust me, I would love to get on stage and play Hall of the Mountain King again or play Gutter Ballet again. I, I love that music, but if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. If, if, if we can somehow get things sorted out and organized a little bit better, hopefully soon, uh, you know, maybe we'll get some new music out. But yeah, you're a smart, you're a smart man, Jeff. You're a diplomatic guy. You're not going to step on any toes. You're not going to say you're not going to be the blabbermouth headline. Jeff says sabotage is back. I get it. I do believe, and I'm just an outsider, <laughs> that people will see sabotage again. I think John has hinted that he is interested. And I think that, and I think Johnny said in my interview that things are possible as well, you know, uh, and that there might be some working, which is great for the fans. At least it, it's so hard to say anything anyway, because even the world right now is not in the place to do it. The focus is to get TSO out there. But I think if you're a Sabotage fan, it, 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 as you said, it, it could happen. You sure. I, I am being <laughs> I am being diplomatic. I'm also being realistic and I do not want to let anybody down. Yeah. You know, I don't want to mislead everybody. It is it is just too easy to take a quote from somebody and run with it. 
Yes. You know, all, all of a sudden now, probably something I've said to you today is going to end up somewhere. Jeff Plate said, and it'll kind of be taken out of context. I but, think you're safe. I usually know. I usually know when it's coming. Every now and uh, then, someone says something, and I go, "I didn't think that was the one." You know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but but listen, in, in respect to all that, I I found myself in this amazing band and an amazing fan base. And, and to be honest with you, man, I cannot believe that. Really, all these years later, especially in Europe. We're one of the we're one of the most requested bands to play festivals in Europe still. I'm sure. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. But it's, it's awesome. In the I think it'll happen. I want to double back just for a minute because we talked about the last Sabotage record. There's a few years off, and then I want to make sure we address your time with Metal Church because I believe it's four records with Metal Church as well. Uh, a Light in the Dark. This is the first one you do, and... Uh, and so this begins the next chapter in Sir Your Metal Career. This is 2006. Yeah, so what led up to this? So Chris Caffrey and I have been best friends and basically joined at the hip since 1995. Uh, Chris did some solo records, which I played on. And we did a tour over in Europe opening for Metal Church. And Metal Church had just kind of been, they just got back on their feet. They had a new band. Kurt had a new band. Uh, way, uh, God, what was the name of the record? Way to the World? Anyhow, they, they, were, they were touring a new record at the time. Gotcha. And, uh, and Capri and myself were the opening band for Metal Church. So we were, we hooked up with these guys. We we're all on the same bus. We got along great. It was just just like Sabotage, you know, once I joined Sabotage, I was just blown away about how much good music there was. So here again with Metal Church, I knew Ton of Bricks, I knew Badland, I knew, you know, Start the Fire. But working with these guys and seeing them play every night, the, the music was awesome. I was blown away by, by Kurt's songs and... The musicality, it was much more than I expected, to be completely honest with you. So anyhow, we all really hit it off. And and then I think it was maybe a year or so after that tour, Kirk Arrington, the original drummer in Metal Church, uh, just had health issues, you know, some back problems and this and that and every other thing. And uh, he just was not able to, to play anymore. And so Kirk called me and said, Jeff, would you like to – would you like to do this record with us? And I said, absolutely. So, so I did the record with Metal Church, officially joined the band, and I was still working with Chris, still doing some stuff with Chris, but then but then Metal Church just became busy. We began working a lot. And uh, but yeah, that was a thrill for me to join Metal Church and, and here again to to go from sabotage, one classic metal band with this great legacy into another one. It was it was an awesome. It was an awesome move, and, and honestly, it was just such a great timing because Sabotage really was not doing anything anymore at that point. TSO had just become a winter, uh, a winter event, and right. you know, so Metal Church kind of filled in the gap for that. Yeah, and you're part of another, you know, like you said, sort of legendary metal band. TSO is still going out every year that you're in Metal Church. So you know, no metal church shows in the uh, in the winter in the Christmas time, but you're going to juggle it. And so, uh, Ronnie Monroe was a singer at this time. Light in the Dark, 2006. This present wasteland, 2008. Generation Nothing, 2013. Uh, and then in 2016, Mike Howe comes back to the band. I think Mike Howe is considered the classic metal church singer. He's not on the first two records, but I think he is. Uh, when MTV was breaking Metal Church and things, I think that he is the person that was associated with it. Um, so we should mention, this is also very new, that uh, Mike Howe has, pa has passed away in July of this year. Uh, he committed suicide. He was obviously dealing with a lot of issues. And so uh, I want to make sure that we give uh, uh, respect to him and his, and his family in that situation. Yep. But So that was your final record with Metal Church. So I want you to tell me, what made you leave? And also what was it like working with Mike? 
Um, it was great. Now, now here again, I've always looked at Sabotage and Metal Church as kind of having parallel careers. You know, both bands, great, great music and probably didn't enjoy the success that they deserved. Whether it's their own fault, whether it's management, whether it's circumstance, whatever. But, you know, I did a light in the dark. I did this present wasteland. And things were just not really going well for Kurt, you know, as far as the promotion of the of the band, so on and so forth. So we we literally shut things down there for several years. We came back into Generation Nothing because we had gotten a new record deal. We hooked up with Rat Pack Records. Um, there was a buzz again, you know. So we did this record. Uh, we did a tour, and but but here again, it's not like we're kids. I'll bang you around a van eating peanut butter sandwiches. We're, we're men. And touring is not easy. So here again, we kind of ran into the situation where it was frustrating. Uh, Ronnie had left the band. But ironically, at the same time, Kurt and Mike had just reconnected on a, on a different project altogether. And, you know, Kurt presented the idea to Mike. Would you be interested in coming back in, into Metal Church? You know, and, and Mike had left the band for all of the reasons that really I had just mentioned, you know, management, the business part of it, the, you know, just the grueling lifestyle. He, he needed to get out of it for a while. And Kurt said, you know, look at Mike thing. The band is different. Um, we have a, we have a better label. We, we are more in control of what we're doing than we ever were. And Mike was, uh, Mike was going through a situation in his life where metal church was like the perfect, this came along at the perfect time for Mike too. So he came back into the band. Kurt was so excited about this. And I mean, you can hear it on the record. I mean, XI is a great record and it is my favorite. I, I am, you know, to me, my proudest moment with Metal Church is, is this record. But having Mike back into the band really made me realize just how good he was and what a rock star he was. If you talk to Mike off the stage, he was just about the most normal, <laughs> unassuming, unassuming guy you're ever going to meet. But on the stage, he brought it and he meant it. And, you know, here Mike Howell comes back to the band. His hair is real short and he looks completely different than he did earlier in the years. But his voice was still intact. His energy was still intact. And he sang great on that record. And when we got together to rehearse, to go out on the tour, you know, for the first time with Mike after all these years, he brought it. He was ready. And the audiences were so great. They, they just love seeing Mike back in the band and having him on stage. And I really, really enjoyed working with Mike. Um, and so what uh, what made you decide? Was it just the touring and things and it just wasn't for you anymore? Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, you know, as we get older, things just start happening in your life, you know, within your family. And then you start wondering, is it is does it make sense for me to be on the road? Right. Does it make sense for me to be on the road and be frustrated? Um, so these were some questions I had to, you know, wrestle with and, and, and answer. Keeping in mind, trans Siberian Orchestra is my career. And, right. you know, drumming is a physical it's a physical event every night you go out and play. So playing in middle church as much as I loved it was honestly wear and tear on me. And, and like I said, here again, you just put the value of being away from home to being at home. And, and I knew at home, I could probably make up for the lost money, you know, by teaching and doing some other things. So, you know, it really wasn't a hard decision. It was sad, but it really wasn't that hard of a decision. And, and I was glad to see those guys, you know, pick up Stet Holland, who was really good friends with Steve Unger. Stet came right in, fit right in with the band, and they, they did uh, two more records, I believe, in, in, in some tours. So so they were able to keep it going after I left. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you stay in contact with Mike Howe, or what, when he passed, was it just out of the blue to you? Um, no, I stayed in touch with everybody, really. Um Kurt, you know, we, we would talk every couple months. Mm -hmm. Mike, yeah, just texting back and forth. You know, yeah. there really wasn't any animosity or anything when I left. It was just like, guys, I got this is what I've got to do. And everybody was totally cool with it. Mike, uh, I had been, you know, in contact with him kind of on a regular basis. 
So through last year, through 2020, um, I was telling him about my original project. And so we were going back and forth on that. I, I spoke with him close to Christmas last year. And, and then in, when 2021 came around, uh, the El Terrain project, okay? So once I got that finished and sent Mike a, a copy of the CD, you know, he had given me his address. But once I sent him the CD, I never got a response. And I texted a couple times, didn't hear anything. I called a couple months later, didn't hear anything. And then I just heard through, through sources that he was going through something. Um, I'm thinking it's more of a midlife crisis. It happens to people. And, but I just, I never would have imagined that Mike was dealing with, with what he was dealing with and, and brought himself to, to taking his life. I mean, that just completely blew my mind when I got that news. And yeah, I feel terrible for his family. I, I met his one son, Elijah, who was a great kid. And, but just knowing Mike, Mike was awesome. He was awesome. So I don't, you know, I'm fascinated how somebody could get to that point and, yeah. and then actually go through with it. You know, it's just like, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And we, and we should definitely mention if there's anyone who is depressed, you know, uh, reach out and try your best to get help because uh, it, this ultimate decision affects so many people's lives. Uh, he's this, this man who has a family, he has friends, he has children yeah. and, uh, and that people should do their best to get help. It's not always the easiest thing. Obviously, he was hiding a lot of uh, uh, demons. Yep, and you know what? Everybody's wired different. I mean, I mean, there's there's upset people, there's depressed people, there's angry people. There's there's all different levels of all this. But 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 when you get into that kind of a place, you know, hopefully you've got it within yourself to just reach out to somebody and literally get some help. Get some help. Talk to somebody. It, it could be a, a conversation you know, or just sitting down face to face with somebody that, that may change things and, and turn life around for you. But, but yeah, if you're ever, you know, like you just said, if, if anybody out there is ever feeling that way, you've got to, you got to reach out because people care. I mean, no matter who you are, there's somebody that cares about you and you would probably be surprised at how many actually do when you, when you look for help. So, so just yeah, do absolutely. It. And, uh, hurt and metal church's statement was also, uh, uh, part of it to honor uh, Mike and his legacy and listen, listen to some metal church music and keep him alive. Uh, not just uh, not for how he tragically passed, but for the life that he lived and the music that he contributed to uh, heavy metal and the whole scene. So, yeah. uh, so we'll leave it on, on that note. It's a heavy subject, but I do want to, uh, these are the hard transitions, you know, uh, my Casey Kasem, you know, we got to make those transitions. Hey, this is life. You know, I mean, we, we've lost the, how many people have we lost in the music world over the past several years? It's like, wow. It's just I amazing. interview someone every day. There's not an interview where there's not going to be something tragic in it and that you can't avoid. Sometimes I talk to people yeah. where they're the last of a scene, especially some of the punk guys. You know, you're talking to someone who five people who are iconic people are gone that they knew. And so yeah. it is part of this uh this life, but it is, and it is good to keep that open dialogue uh, as well. So I want to talk about All Terrain. Well, you, you have a record that came out this year. Difficult time to put out a record. Yes. The record's going to have to have a little extra life. You know what I mean? If this is not a one thing, a one year thing, we've got to get people to listen to it. We're going to put a link in the description so people can check it out. This is called Mother's Day. It is available now. Uh, Jeff, tell us about it. So this project started back in the Wicked Witch days. We were talking about Zach Stevens and my friend Matt Leff. Uh, as we were in Boston rehearsing and, and writing songs, I, uh, we had a rehearsal room and I had this primitive recording setup, a couple of cassette decks and a couple of sound boards and a reverb unit and had everything in the room mic'd up well enough to record what we were doing. And, and, I have literally 25 cassette tapes, 90 minute tapes full of us playing. And a lot of stuff is songs that we were working on. Some of it is just myself and Matt Leff jamming, you know, off the cuff jamming on stuff. There was just so much stuff there that we never did anything with that 
I had reached out to Matt several years ago and, and asked if he would mind if I took some of this music and did something with it. Matt, unfortunately, at the time, had uh, was going through cancer. He was no longer able to play himself. He gave me his blessing, you know, go ahead and just keep me posted on what you're doing. I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you come up with. And then, and then we lost Matt two years ago to cancer. Well, so, sorry. yeah. So there's another another one lost uh, tragically. But but this is where this all started. And I have some local friends who are very, very good players. Uh, Tommy Cook is a local guitar player who is excellent. And Matt Leff was one hell of a guitar player. Tommy Cook was the only guy I could think of locally that was going to be able to pull this off and maybe grasp what Matt and I were doing. So Tommy and I got together and just started banging some ideas around. And literally some of these song ideas had been kicking around in my head for over 20 years. Uh, I had some lyrics. I had the, the title for this record has been in my head for, for all that time. And once Tommy and I got together and started hashing a couple things out. It's like, wow, this is actually really good. So then we brought in Kevin McCarthy, another local friend on bass. He started, uh, he was part of the process now. So what we did was we took some, some riffs, some unfinished ideas from the old Wicked Witch days and filled out the rest of it with original music. So this was something, this is, was my bucket list project. I always wanted to do something that I produced, that I wrote the lyrics for, that I arranged, that I basically directed. And these guys just totally dug what I was thinking and everything kind of fell into place. So brought in two more local guys, Colin Holloway on vocals and guitar and Zach Hamilton on vocals and keys. And we just began building this record. And one thing led to another, to another, to another. Before you know it, we had, we had 10 songs that we really felt good about. And after the TSO tour in 2020, I reached out to Jane Mangini, who is keyboardist in TSO West. Mm -hmm. And granted, when TSO rehearses, there's two full bands. Everybody talks to everybody. Everybody talks about oh, we should do this or we should do that, blah, blah, blah. You know, so I called Jay and I said, well, we've always been talking about working together. I'd like, like you to check something out. And I sent her a couple songs off this record and she absolutely loved it. And she she brought some keyboards into this mix, which completely, I don't want to say completely, but it changed the dynamic of what we were doing. It just filled out the sound. We sounded more epic. In one sense, it made us heavier. In another sense, it made us a little more pop, a little more melodic. But it really filled in some of the gaps that we had in, in the songs. And, and that was the lineup for the group. So I went ahead and finished the record. Uh, Joe O'Brien at Rat Pack Records decided to, to take this on and release it for me. So, yeah, something I'm very, very proud of. But like I said, it was something in my head for many, 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 many years. And the guys that I've worked with on this, I, I couldn't thank them enough for, for embracing what I was thinking and bringing this all to life. So yeah, again, it came out in January and reviews have been very good so far. Yeah, and this is, I say to every one of my guests, this is the time to check out uh, music. You know, it's, music is so accessible. There's no excuse not to discover. Yes something new if people have liked your other projects i know fans there's a lot of fans of your drumming this is something different that they can check out it's easy the link is in the description now jeff stop me if you've heard this before i'm no paul o'neill but i got some ideas what about the first mother's day uh, holiday touring act you see you put together like a all-terrain east and west and you cover mother's day and <laughs> it's a uh, it's you know maybe not a full orchestra but you, you you'll be you will be the only Mother's Day uh, touring act. I, I maybe 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 I didn't think it through. But you know, uh, everybody's got to have an angle, right? I mean, you, yeah, you, listen, we're, trying to, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to keep it going. Obviously, Mother's Day refers to Mother Earth and uh, things like yes, that. Yes. And I'm having a little fun with your with your record. But uh, hey, you, know, you know, in respect to that, I'll be happy if we can do one show live. I mean, this is. Uh, response to the record has been really good, and you know we're, we're we're working on the second one now. But man, I would love to be able to get this thing out and do it live. It's the the live, you know, the live music scene right now is completely 
it's still messed up. So how do we fit into that? We'll figure it out. But uh, but I look forward to the day where Elto Rain can go do some live shows. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put all the links in the description so that people can find your projects. They can check out the Trans-Siberian dates that are upcoming and uh, and pick up your record and so much more. And uh, I, now i got to get Chris here so that he can talk about his sabotage. I'm, I'm working the sabotage history little by little, and uh, maybe one day we'll get John to talk about uh, the future as well. So yeah. I really appreciate it, and I, I hope I'll see you again very soon. Thank you for having me, man. Take care.